hey everyone. First off, we at The Familiar Strange want to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we are producing this podcast and pay our respect to the elders of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, past, present and emerging. Let's go. Hello and welcome to The Familiar Strange. I am Julia Brown, your familiar stranger for today. Welcome to the podcast, brought to you with support from the Australian Anthropological Society, the Australian National University's College of Asia and Pacific, and the College of Arts and Social Sciences, coming to you from the Australian Centre for the Public Awareness of Science, and produced in collaboration with the American Anthropological Association. This is the sixth episode of our STS season, and I am talking with Rosalind Attenborough, who is currently completing her PhD at the Science, Technology and Innovation Studies Centre at the University of Edinburgh. Having done her undergraduate training here at the ANU, where I might add she published her first article in the journal Nature and won the University Medal for Biology, Ros worked in open access publishing for three years for PLOS journals, before retraining in the Social Studies of Science at University College London and then the Uni of Edinburgh. Since 2015, she has been researching how scientists view the idea of scientific openness. Ros explored this question by doing 54 interviews with scientists in the field of biology, including biological anthropology, and policy makers and advocates, mostly from the UK, but also Australia and the US and elsewhere. As you're about to hear, the meaning of openness in science is multidimensional and is becoming an increasingly critical topic. Openness in science can refer to open access publishing, open methods and data, and interpersonal openness. If you're a researcher, how open would you be willing to be with your colleagues, or the public, about pre-published ideas? If you're a member of the public, how much do you want to know before papers are peer-reviewed? Ros explains what has driven open access policy changes in the UK in particular, the funding inequality this produces, and cultures of value and trust economies in science, which are pressing in today's digital age. Ros encourages us to consider the question of openness in ethnographic methods too, and here the matter of context and trust moves into the foreground. As a case study of cultural influences on openness, we contemplate the CRISPR baby scandal when a Chinese researcher went against Western ethical codes to produce HIV-resistant twins using an unauthorised genetic editing tool. We consider the role of collegial responsibility and issues of confidence between scientists and institutions. Yes, openness in science is a big topic. On a personal note, which you might pick up on because of the more conversational style of this interview, Roz is a friend of mine who I have known for 20 years. Roz is one of the most gracious, unassuming and trustworthy people I know and you will understand too after listening to her here why she was the ideal person to conduct the research that she has. When I first arrived in the UK to start fieldwork, I remember one night over dinner finding huge relief in Roz's presence and ability to dive gently into challenging topics that were overwhelming me such as ethics, social inequality, schizophrenia, etc. Our nourishing catch-ups during her last visit to Canberra and the ANU organically prompted the recording of this interview. As Ros remarks towards the end, talking about unpublished ideas is a way of experimenting with what one of her participants described as a generosity pays philosophy. I hope you enjoy Ros's generosity as much as I always do. And here it is, my conversation with my sparkling friend and colleague, Ros Attenborough. start then by unpacking what is meant by the term openness in science. I use the phrase openness in science because I was trying to be more abstract and expansive about a term that's probably more often described as just open science and that itself is a sort of abstraction of lots of different things. But what I was interested in is this sort of technology related phenomenon of the last two decades or so, so since the early 2000s mostly, of open things things where the word open is used in relation to them. So open access in relation to sort of publishing industry, open data, open peer review, open methods. It's a very inviting term, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's a term that's hard to object to, but it has become a buzzword in a way that it wasn't before these last couple of decades, but it does appear in other contexts outside science as well and outside research. And my belief is that The actual use of the word open comes from open source software, 
which was a thing in the sort of in the decades leading up to the start of the 21st century sort of business models and practices in software about sort of community involvement in the making of software and often sort of liberal licensing processes in relation to software so not necessarily proprietary software which has to be bought is only made by a certain company and only modified by a certain company and there there was a kind of ideological debate in that context between free and open source software which was sort of playing out at near the end of the 20th century. And so there are different meanings to free and open in that context. And I think the open of open science has come from there. It's a whole ideological debate. And how did you personally come to be interested in this? My original involvement in this comes from working for an open access publishing company, the Public Library of Science, which is now abbreviated to PLOS. I came to that because I was interested in cultures of science already, and I wanted to know, you know, what goes on behind the scenes to produce a scientific article. How does knowledge become legitimate? And it just happened that this whole debate about openness was starting to come about at this time and really accelerate. And so PLOS was a company that was founded in order to prove that you could have a working business model that could make published articles open to the public rather than behind subscriptions. And it actually started as a big petition to publishers to try and get them to open up their material to the public. But when that didn't really work, because the scientific community is so dependent on those journals, they got a big grant and they were able to turn into a publisher and try and show that this open business model worked. Wow. And this has become a policy driven enterprise now, isn't it, in terms of open access publishing? So PLOS wasn't the only open access publisher in this space. There were also PLOS is a not-for-profit organisation, there were also commercial publishers. It began to get more legitimate. I mean, I found in my interviews that people often remember specifically the open access journals at the start of this movement, the, the scientists that I've spoken to. But it's also become more visible through policies. So, for example, in the UK, there was, in 2012, there was a thing called the Finch Report, which recommended to government that there were economic as well as other benefits to opening up the scientific literature. And there's a very powerful argument that goes, you know, if the taxpayer paid for this research to be done, then the research should be accessible to the taxpayer. And that kind of approach became very legitimate in the UK. And some comparable things have happened around the world. But what's happened from that time until now is that the UK, for instance, have open access policies which require the people they fund to make things open access by one means or another. So the the research councils in Australia have open access policies, but you don't have to do open access so quickly. There are different mechanisms. And overall, it's a bit less stringent than in the UK. Interesting. So Mm -hmm. do you feel that you could have done your current line of research from an Australian institution? Yeah, I could Mm -hmm. have done. And I am sort of trying to compare the two contexts a bit. It's only gradually that it's become clear to me that they're actually pretty different specifically in relation to open access. So that's kind of interesting. There are two ways of doing, two main ways of doing open access. One of them is via journal. So you publish in a journal that is an open access journal or you pay a fee to a subscription journal. Like it's called a hybrid journal and they will make that particular article open access. Or you can get a certain version of the article that's been peer reviewed, but it's not all polished up and it goes into a repository, and that's also open access, so it doesn't have to happen via journal publishing. So the major difference between the UK and Australia is that following on from the Finch report that I mentioned, a lot of money was put behind doing open access, and open access via journals rather than via repositories was favoured by that policy. So there are these big funds, or sort of dwindling funds, Mm. that are available for authors to apply to, especially authors who are at wealthy well-funded institutions and who have grants have access to this kind of money to make their work open access via a journal. And the Wellcome Trust is a big funder. They have this set of money. All the research councils have this money to varying extents. And so a situation has developed in the UK whereby open access is a requirement and lots of money is available to pay for it, but it's led to some perverse kind of economic effects. This money is often funneled into the very powerful publishers that were the whole reason why open access came about in the first place, because the money is not just going to the new open access journals who only make money that way. It's going to the big subscription publishers as well who've developed open access options. Ah, but with the condition that the authors have to pay, so then they use their funds. 
Yeah, so some of these big subscription publishers have dual income streams from the open access and from their subscriptions, and there's sort of controversy over how fair that is. It's certainly not what was intended by many open access advocates. And what do the scientists think of this? Right, so... We're talking about open access specifically, but it's open access is the most widespread policy phenomenon related to openness. And I found that a lot of scientists, pretty much all scientists are aware of open access when I ask them about openness in science. At least half will talk to me about open access straight away. And most other people will say it at some point. And when I talk about open access to them, they all know what I'm talking about. So it's very salient in the lives of the scientists, the biologists I spoke to, most of them are pretty positive about it. There's a feeling that obviously it's a good thing for all of our articles to be available to the public. Obviously, that's especially good if those articles were paid for by public money. But it's a kind of distanced process. It's a very bureaucratic process in some ways, and it's associated heavily with money, which means, I think, I think I can say that most of these people I spoke to only thought about open access as this journal-mediated process, which is sometimes called gold open access. So they're not thinking of free options for open access, which can occur via repositories. This impression has probably been enhanced by the policy landscape in the UK in particular. But even in Australia, people I've spoken to think you need to pay money to do open access, which is not necessarily the case. So, And would that be a deterrent then? So do Yeah, so you've got people. some people just see it as a sort of expense that they're going to have to contend with. They often see it as being in conflict in some way with other research expenses. And others have this kind of scepticism towards it. They feel that sort of different power plays are happening behind the scenes, like who's getting rich off this this money. I think when people talk about open access, it kind of can expose feelings of scarcity. Mm-hmm. When they see it as an economic phenomenon, they see it as something that's potentially challenging not only their time, if it's something they have to spend time doing admin tasks around, but it's something that's also potentially spending their money. And regardless of whether that is logical, whether it's something that deserves to have money spent on it or not, a lot of scientists are in a position where they already feel a scarcity of research funds. And so they can perceive open access as a a drain on that or a stressor. Yeah. Okay, so we're talking about assumptions that are made and the values and how policy feeds in here. But I guess what I'm interested in as well is this idea of cultures of openness in mm. science. Yeah, and that yeah, I feel like it, that's something I'm trying to get at from lots of different angles. And in a way, I guess something I was pretty interested in from early in the project is how openness may be a very long-held, long-established value in science or sort of idealized version of how science works. So one of the bits I looked into earlier was there's this sociologist of science called Robert Merton who had four norms which he said defined the ethos of science. And And he's the big STS data upper, isn't he? Yeah, so he's, I mean, the way I've experienced him is he's often introduced at the beginning of sociology of science courses as being one of the earliest sociologists of science but one who sort of was there before people started really deconstructing what knowledge means and what knowledge is and how it comes about. So he was studying Mm. cultures of science without necessarily studying the content of knowledge. I still think what he did is important and I'm kind of linking back, trying to link back and see what the significance of some of the stuff he said is now. One of these norms was communism or communalism, which was this idea that, that knowledge was not owned by the individual scientists but it was a sort of collectively owned thing. So he said the substantive findings of science are a product of social collaboration and are assigned to the community. Secrecy is the antithesis of this norm and full and open communication is its enactment. So this is like a sort of early notion of what openness in science could mean. And Merton is often criticised for the idea that he's trying to describe how science is whereas many people argue these sorts of norms don't actually reflect the way scientists practice at all. But I think those norms are quite important in the sense that they do speak to ideals that are circulating in the culture of science and I think still do circulate. Uh, Institutions like the Royal Society in the UK will talk about how openness has been important to science for hundreds of years. I'm kind of interested, does this new version of openness, which we see in the last 20 years, is that related to this older notion of openness? And if you speak to scientists about openness in science, do they relate, relate to kind of either of those things? Do they feel like there are cultural norms or ideals operating in their settings? Or do they 
recognize open access or open data as being part of those norms. Yeah, yeah. and I guess these communities of practice are really becoming more transparent as well. And that's not just the finished product of publications, it's pre-publication forms and the patency of particular types of data or genes or whatever it is. It seems that that can happen pre-publication. Yeah, I suspect you're right about the idea of there being this philosophy around having shared approaches Hmm. to science I don't yeah, know if this is yeah. going off What you're saying bit, is but... making me think of a few things. I guess one of them is that a lot of advocates of open science allude to this history of openness as an ideal in science and their idea of what they're doing is kind of reviving an ideal that's sort of become corrupted or forgotten. And the other thing is that most of these new open science ideas are associated with the internet. And the idea that the internet can kind of bring us some ideal level of open science that was never possible in the past is also really present in narratives about open science. And the way I was introduced to PLOS when I worked in open access was what we have now is a setting where we've been doing publications in a certain way for 300 years or something now. The internet changes things. And I think for some people who are open science advocates, they see it as the main thing that has changed and and that it has transformed everything. And that kind of technological ideology associated with open science is quite interesting. And I think that's how open source software also comes in. So the open science movement is a In some ways, it's a kind of highly technical field. And a lot of people who work in software or in digital technology, they move in and out of open science fields and open science advocacy. And that that defines some of the features of it. And what about openness in terms of methods? I see open methods as one of the sort of facets of this open science agenda. So within this open science sort of policy agenda, open access and openness of data are two of the biggest ones. But then there's a whole set of other different practices that are associated with with open science. One of them would be being open about exactly what your methods are and perhaps making your methods available online in very detailed ways and very trackable ways, ways that you can exactly link. So we saw a, a demonstration from a guy who'd made some software where you can kind of lodge your protocols as a, as a scientist online and say exactly what you did at each stage, make it visible to other people, allow them to make copies of the protocol, record as you're going through the protocol exactly how you did it and whether you made a modification at any different step. Does this relate to your idea of open methods in anthropology? How does that? I think open methods in anthropology is there is no fixed protocol. It's just really interesting to me how like that level of accountability, making that method available to others to learn from as well seems like a really wonderful thing, although I can imagine people's hesitations as Mm. well. I mean, one question I'd have for you, I guess, is I think in anthropology, so a lot of your field notes and things would be part of the process of, of your method. And those things are often quite private and personal and maybe very different to a protocol in a biology lab where consistency about how every step is carried out and what concentration something is at and exactly how many minutes you do something at there's a very different philosophy behind that than the field notes of an anthropologist definitely and you know we're even trained in so far as we are given some tools before we go into the field to make shorthand codes for ourselves so mm. in a way only we can understand yeah, field notes really anyway because it's yes. more efficient that mm. way mm. but also it is a privacy and a liability thing maybe you know if your data was audited I mean you know all data should be able to be audited is that a concept um, in anthropology that all data should be able to be well audited or? I think perhaps it should be but mm. I'm I don't think it it is I think that very rarely would it be unless someone was working in a particularly controversial area but mm. Yeah, it does add this extra... It's almost like a a layer of deceit in a way, which sounds... Yeah, so I find find this really interesting because I think sometimes the assumption in an open science context is that more open is always better. And so if you can document every 
exact process that occurs in an online way and maybe even in a live way that's going to make your research more accountable and more reliable and all of these things but this is where context comes in because I think openness has a different purpose in different contexts and trust is a really important issue here so the question of why you're being open so are you being open in order to gain trust because you're showing that you're absolutely trustworthy by being willing to share share absolutely every detail of what you did or does openness say nobody is really trustworthy because we have to be able to see the details and some people have said to me in interviews things like I'm not sure how I would benefit from having the raw data on this thing in order to investigate someone's trustworthiness because if I don't trust them to start with, I won't trust their raw data either because there, mm. there are kind of two common rationales for open data. One of them is for reusability purposes. So if you've got a big genetic data set, someone else might be able to ask different questions of it and it's sort of like a resource. And the other one is can you use the data to drill into what someone actually did and check whether they made any mistakes or whether they perhaps even committed some kind of fraud during the process? Yeah. yeah. So in other fields, it also depends what what is the purpose of that openness? Is it for someone to be able to also benefit from the observations you made as an anthropologist? And will they be able to have enough context to do things like that? Or is it to check that you followed best practice as a researcher and that your results are reliable? And can that be checked and what what sort of culture do we want to have in those disciplines about trust this is really confronting to think about (laughs) i guess the individual ethnographer doing their research could never organise their data such or their methods such that someone else could emulate it in the mm. same way because so much of anthropology is about the anthropologist interpreting things in a certain mm. way and, you know, being reflexive about that, you know, why have they chosen to focus on this instead of that? But I think that it would be of benefit to have more of an openness about you know, for example, I did a lot of interviews for my fieldwork and I think it's probably important that that interview data is potentially available because what my mm. participant said, someone else could quite reasonably reinterpret that and that would be an okay part of my data to reinterpret. Mm. But in terms of all the field notes and the other things that I was looking at, that is very subjective. Yeah, I think that all of these questions deserve like just that little bit extra thought about what would openness look like in for my study and in my discipline what would it achieve what effects would it have and you know that when you have research interview data it's never going to be as simple as just publishing it on the internet Mm. um there there are all the ethical considerations there's a consideration like when do you talk to your participant about what it would mean to have something online. How does that affect how open they're going to be with you in the interview? There's this kind of playoff between openness in private spaces and openness in public spaces. I did actually have one interview where where the person was really forthcoming and we had a great discussion and, and they said, you know, anything I'd say to you, I'd say to anyone. That's just how frank I am. That's how I live my life. But when I sent the transcript to them, they said that it had been this trusting environment and they had said a bit more you know, particularly about certain issues than they would normally have done. And it might not be best for everyone if all this information was to go online. So we sort of negotiated about it and decided we'll take a pseudonym instead. And, you know, are there certain aspects of the transcript that should be kind of redacted a bit just to protect some other people? Yeah, this is a a really interesting issue I find in anthropology as well, because I can't help but think that people want to represent their participants in their best light, right? Mm. Like they they don't want to say things that their participants wouldn't be pleased about. But that Mm. puts a bias on research potentially, doesn't it? Yeah, and I think, yeah, we all feel that pressure when when we have participants who are invested in our research um, and open being open in the kind of online openness sense does disrupt this kind of setting potentially. I think reflexivity in social sciences context is a interesting comparable kind of virtue are you going to do any reflexivity <laughs> in your thesis <laughs> i guess um i mean the stuff about how i try to be open or not in in mm. my own methods and with my own participants is 
about reflexivity. And being and, informed by the fact that you're a biologist before, so you yes. can relate to your participants. Biologists and the sort of open advocates are both aspects of my past and mm. present in a way. So I really sympathise with and sort of understand a lot of the points of view. But at the same time, I'm trying to challenge some of those assumptions and unpack those topics a bit more yeah quite hard sometimes to (laughs) disentangle your personal feelings from it another thing I was thinking about is issues with cultural differences in values of openness so I was thinking about this in regards to the CRISPR baby scandal with the Chinese researcher He Zhengqi and for those listeners unfamiliar in 2013 this particular DNA splicing technique was discovered which allowed DNA to be kind of snipped out and subbed in from a human embryo, am I right, Ros? As opposed to the embryo being selected as a whole through yeah, IVF? So you're, yeah, you're able to edit the genes rather than just selecting the embryo that has the certain genes. Yes, exactly. That's <laughs> a much simpler way of putting it. So the researchers who were involved in this technique proposed a moratorium, but it has come out in the last six months that a Chinese researcher ignored this, but he was also consulting some colleagues in the US about what he was doing. These twin girls were created through this technique against all the the rules, but no one had any protocol to deal with it, basically. Yeah. And I guess I'm just thinking about this in terms of how people share ideas but also hold responsibility for the ideas of their colleagues Mm. if there is this trust in that kind of pre-authentification phase of science. Yeah, yeah. So I might be wrong, but my impression of this research is that like the rules about what research you can and can't do what norms apply to that are not necessarily clear. And especially in this case, I don't know if China had any clear rules. So I think basically, so he came out and said that he'd done this, but sort of contravening lots of norms and expectations about how he was expected to behave. But it's difficult to point to exactly if he broke a law or something. I, no, because I, I think he was actually quite pleased, wasn't he? Was, he yeah, so he was announcing is... this fight. It's very, yeah, no, it's quite confusing to interpret. And I experienced some of this in a publishing context because you would sometimes get, on a much more minor level, sort of scandals of some sort coming up. And there really isn't necessarily a system of accountability because scientists are not part of like a single professional body about good practice in science. So if you think someone's done something wrong, what we would often do is, as publishers, we were kind of overseers of such processes but we had no power to say whether someone had done something wrong or not so if things got escalated to a certain level we would sort of alert an institution that something might have happened and we wouldn't know if the institution would look into it or not or whether the institution had any rules so that's one lens through which I can understand this in a way but in terms of the responsibility of other researchers this does kind of relate to the research I've done because one of the things that researchers talk to me a lot about is interpersonal openness as a type of openness so I asked researchers what first comes to mind when you think about openness in science and they do point to things from the kind of open science agenda like open access and open data and they point out all sorts of other things but one of the very biggest categories of things they talk to me about is how they talk with their colleagues particularly in the context of conferences and they're, they're really talking about conversations that happen in sort of circles of trust How do they speak about the work that's kind of, in a way, a bit vulnerable because they haven't yet published it and perhaps they haven't even yet got funding to pursue it? So these ideas are spoken of as being really valuable and potentially it's risky to share ideas Mm. with other scientists when there's a kind of prestige economy going on where scientists are competing for grants and they're competing for prestigious publications. Uh, But they also... Like a good proportion of the scientists I spoke to frame this kind of interpersonal openness as really one of the most valuable things about doing science. This idea that by talking to your colleagues at this sort of early stage, you can get really useful feedback. This CRISPR case is like quite an extreme example of what might happen in a circle of trust. Or maybe not a circle of trust, but it sounds like this researcher shared with some people in a sort of inner circle what he was doing. And I think doing. he was given feedback such that I believe he was told 
to stop doing what he was doing, but mm. he still believed in a greater good. Yeah, so do his colleagues share responsibility for that? And I guess that is an area that is completely without explicit norms, although mm. there may be implicit norms. From what I've seen, scientists that I've spoken to have very different views a lot of them recognise these kinds of conversations as being incredibly valuable. None of, what, none of them have spoken to me about those conversations being opportunities to regulate one's colleagues or keep them in check. But they could have that function. I think possibly it might be important to bring in a wider context here in the sense that the value of these interpersonal, sometimes one-to-one -one interactions is that they happen outside of sort of institutional regulatory procedures. Mm. And it would be quite sinister if there were rules and governance over how people have conversations with each other and what information they share. And if you want to set up a system in which there's accountability and in which when people have concerns about their colleagues, they raise those concerns, I think you have to develop more trust in a community of scientists because there's not necessarily a lot of trust between scientists and the upper levels of the institutions and bureaucracies that they're part of. And that does link with, mm. with openness policies in a way because I see a lot that people see their institutional structures as putting a lot of burdens on what they do. There's a very big leap between saying that there should be oversight on ethical things like this CRISPR case and assuming that scientists should have the kind of structures and norms and trust available them to them to be able to be whistleblowers in cases like this. The whole notion of openness might be compromised if there were rules in place, because then people, by proxy of that, have to become less open and more cautious. Do you mean if scientists, if they're watching each other for... Instead of it being an informal peer review, yeah. it, it might jeopardise the yeah. extent to which they can have those fruitful, raw conversations. Yes, I agree. I think that there's an enormous value to these informal, interpersonal interactions that scientists have. And this case is a very extreme one. But I think it highlights the fact that probably scientists don't really know what to do if this kind of information is shared with them. Like, where, who would they raise this to? They could raise it to their own institution. They can't be mm. sure of what the institutional response would be. It's so messy, isn't it? Yeah, I think these spaces of like where people trust each other definitely have an important function. But there are other potential downsides. For example, what happens outside those circles of trust? Who is included and who isn't included? It links back to what we were talking a bit about. So sometimes when you have these very personal private conversations, exactly who is part of them and how they operate influences the function of that openness between people. But it also means, and I, this did come up in my interviews, that there are people outside the circle of trust. So that could operate to sort of reinforce inequalities in certain ways. What kind of people are outside the circles of trust, do you mean? For instance, I interviewed someone, she and her husband are both scientists and have both pursued careers, but in order to stay in the same place, she's switched disciplines a few times and she feels more on, she's like she had been more on the periphery and felt like maybe, you know, maybe she could have networked be better, but she did have a sense that sort of certain trusted conversations were occurring somewhere where she wasn't. And so she might not know the lowdown on who you can and can't trust in this field or which results are maybe thought to be a bit suspect. The people who are excluded might be people who are already systematically excluded for other reasons in, in their scientific careers. It's a very kind yeah. of subtle thing. But I think it does link with this, mm. this case of, you know, who are the people who get exposed to this sort of sensitive information about what's the research that's going on before it gets published? And are those people going to call it out if it's not going in an ethically sound Yeah, direction? and how much does it affect them until there are consequences? Are people used to blinding themselves to problematic things they don't want to hear about yeah, because they're so... because they, they're part of a homogenous group of people who have certain interests, perhaps? Yeah, and maybe um, they're focusing on their own research, which presumably would be related, mm. but they feel like they wouldn't have the energy to deal with the ethics of something like this. Mm. And then yeah. Yeah, it might and not I wouldn't, be until they're forced to reflect on yeah. it. And mm. I wouldn't underestimate the kind of disruptive power to someone's career of them feeling like they're about to get embroiled in a big scandal. Um, yeah, <laughs> I do. <laughs> I think most people would avoid that if they could. Yeah, but also I think it's reflective of the fact that there's not much institutional support to scientists who find themselves in the position of being potential whistleblowers. No, especially when things play out so much online now. 
Yeah, there's an interesting aspect here to do with whether you deal with any controversial issues or potentially viral issues in in your research. I think you briefly touched on pre-publication openness in yes. terms of what forms of research do you share before publication, apart from just in, in conversation and putting preprints online, so versions of articles that haven't yet been peer reviewed. In biology, preprints have really taken off in the last, like just even the last few years when I've been studying it. People ha- sometimes have objections to them in, because they're not yet peer reviewed, so sometimes people perceive them as circulating so called unverified information or they, people might be concerned about the different versions of the article that will then come out or whether the, the subsequent publisher will be upset that the information is already accessible. And this has all changed vastly, and I see many more scientists these days, particularly younger scientists, who see it as a good thing because they can get their information out there faster. It has a kind of date stamp on it so they can prove that they have been working on this thing and they had made this conclusion by this time. They can use it in various ways in sort of career contexts to say what they've done without relying on the timelines of publishers. Different people view this differently in terms of whether what's a legitimate thing to cite. Huge yes. variations in opinion. But I have seen from an openness point of view, like if you work in a field that has sort of a public face to it, say it's something medical or climate change related or something like that, it's a lot to take on to be open with your research because then you have to stand behind your own claims by yourself. And if the topic is controversial, you may have to deal with some sort of yeah, there's a lot media on spot. I, yeah, I was thinking about pre-publication publishing in the context of what we're doing here at The yeah. Familiar Strange, where, you yeah. know, we're talking through ideas and, you know, you could write a, pa- a paper on this one day, Ross, and it's on this podcast. But, I mean, I, I think it, all of us here at TFS believe in, and you know, encouraging conversation this way as well. But at the same time, none of us would write blogs or talk about a very specific thing that we were going to write a paper about. But then is that really hypocritical yeah I don't know well that's another just to always skirt around the fringes of topics rather than (laughs) really diving in yeah that's another one of the nuances of the context of openness when I have these conversations with scientists I what's often impressed upon me is that they're really experts of these nuances they're always thinking about regardless of whether the context is a publication or a pre-publication or a conversation they tend to be aware or at least able to reflect on Exactly what am I saying here to whom? How much am I saying? What am I not saying? I mean, you could frame that as hypocritical, but I think it acknowledges that all parts of life are contextual in that way in terms of how open or otherwise you are and whether that's a bad thing or not sort of comes down to your rationale for doing it. So I I think about that sometimes because I think it's somehow an instinct that is sometimes impressed upon young researchers, depending on the people who've spoken to you or mentored you, that you should be careful with your ideas and you might be worried that someone else is going to publish something similar to you and take away the whole point of your PhD or some sort of possibly exaggerated prospect (laughs) along those lines. With my own topic, I feel like I am talking right now about some aspects and concepts that I'm going to write about. And I'm doing so consciously, I think, because I've come across in my interviews this attitude that some of the researchers have taken on that they're just going to share generously their ideas in the in the manner that you described as the philosophy of this podcast partly because it's just a nice thing to do but often because there are benefits that come back to you there's a reciprocity to it and then people can interrogate your ideas and they can enrich them like one of my interviewees described this as a generosity pays policy and so I yeah I've thought about how much do I say and do I hold back anything and in a way what I'm doing is an experiment by not holding back things and if any negative consequences come of that it would be quite interesting for my research oh well look this might be a nice profound note to end on (laughs) thank you so much Roz it's been really thought provoking thank you very much Julia that was really fun That was it, me and Ros Attenborough. Today's episode was produced by me, Julia Brown, with help from our other familiar strangers, Jody Lee Tramba, Simon Theobald and Kali Wong Dolan. Our executive producers are Deanna Cato and Matthew Fung. 
Subscribe to the Familiar Strange podcast. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify and all the other familiar places. And don't forget to leave us a rating or review with your likes or dislikes. It helps people find the show and helps make us better. And if you'd like to support us, please check out our Patreon page, patreon.com slash thefamiliarstrange, not The Strange Familiars, which is another fun podcast, just not ours. You can find the show notes, including a list of all the books and papers mentioned today, plus our blog about anthropology's role in the world at thefamiliarstrange.com. If you'd like to contribute to the blog or have anything to say to me or the other hosts of this program, email us at submissions at thefamiliarstrange.com, tweet us at TFS Tweets, or look us up on Facebook and Instagram. If you haven't joined our Facebook chats group yet, do that and please comment on this episode. Our music's by Pete Dabro. Special thanks today to Nick Farrelly, Will Grant, Martin Pierce and Maud Rowe. Thanks so much for listening. See you in two weeks. And until then, keep talking strange.